Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to J70 Monday number two, where we're going to talk about uh, tips from your mainsail trimmer. I'm uh, Alan Terhune, joining you from Annapolis, Maryland. Hope everyone is having a great day. Uh, before we get into our presenters and presentation, I want to take a few minutes to remind everyone to support uh, the class we all love and, and are thrilled to participate in uh, by joining the J70 class if you're not already a member. Uh, there's a link on there uh, right now on yacht scoring for you to pay your dues. And if you have the opportunity, please make sure you pay your dues. The class needs us now more than ever to uh, keep things up and running in the slow time. And uh, it, it just shows our solidarity in, in the, the fleet we all care about. So um, there's my little two second uh, spiel on that. But as we go forward, as I said, we're going to have J70 Monday talking about mainsail trim. And I'm really thrilled to have two of my colleagues here are two of the best mainsail trimmers in the class. I have uh, Zeke on the line. Hey, Alan. Hey, Zeke. And Julio, who's also here. Ciao, Alan. Ciao, everybody. Glad to hear from both of you. So uh, before we dive into the presentation, uh, Zeke, if you could just give us a, a quick uh, recap of what you're doing right now, J70Ys, and what your, what your projects are. Yeah, sure. Well, I've been uh, very fortunate to get to sail on the J70 class pretty much since the outset. I remember that first Key West race week, there were still a bunch of people sailing with uh, just three people in their boat. Now we're going to see Julio and his team sailing around with five of their friends in one boat. So it's been pretty cool to be a part of this really fun class, see the growth and um, get to race against the best sailors in the world. Most recently, I've been doing a lot of this kind of legs in mainsail trimmer uh, tactician role and just been kind of really learning a lot about what it takes to make the team go fast, make the boat go fast, trim the sails right. So it's, it's been really fun to be a part of it. Awesome. And, and Julio, if you could uh, fill us in a little bit on what you, you've got going. Yeah, I, I started my career in the J70 some years ago in the 2016, if I'm not wrong, as a coach of the Petit Terrible team. Uh, it was the year of the San Francisco World Championship. And uh, then I switch, I, I joined the Gisbottino teams uh, uh, as a tactician. So the first role is being as a tactician. And then uh, I choose to switch to, to the main sail trimmer role with the Calvi teams. And uh, I find a really good uh, group of uh, friends and great sailor. And uh, since last year, I start sailing uh, again with my old friends of Petit Terrible, so with Claudio Matteo, uh, Michele and Rossella. We had uh, a great season. I find a great uh, group and uh, yeah, I'm really proud to work with them and put all my effort uh, uh, for, uh, to keep, you know, to, to achieve the goals uh, that we have. Awesome. Well, as, as you all can see, we have two very experienced top end mainsail trimmers here and uh, we're going to get right to it. So Zeke, you know, beginning of the day, you guys are off the dock, you're getting ready to go racing. And uh, like most top teams do, you start pretty much racing from the moment you leave the dock. So uh, well, if you could walk us through what your initial setup is, what you look for uh, from your seat in the house as main trimmer. Yeah, well, I definitely like to be able to be ready to go as soon as we get out to the racing circle. You kind of, a lot of times you see teams get out and round the committee boat and then just kind of figure out what they want to do with their rig tune. And they, uh, in my mind, kind of waste a lot of time and opportunity to be practicing. So I, I like to kind of have the day start right when you leave the dock, you kind of start thinking about what you're your rig tune settings might be because all of this mainsail trim stuff that we're talking about really comes from making sure you're confident in your own rig tune and you know starting with your tuning guide for sure but the more you can kind of dial in your specific main and uh and your mast and what you're comfortable with based on all your practice you know kind of the better and i know julio it's something we talked about quite a lot and you've got a pretty good kind of setup for what you're looking for as you leave the dock with weather forecasts and all that what, are you looking at kind of the same stuff yeah, you know, I, I, uh, as you said, we start uh, we start racing probably when when we wake up, and, you know, checking the forecast. Uh, and the first thing that I do while I'm on the dock, but uh, especially when uh, when I go out and for the to to arrive at the race course, uh, I start to check if the forecast uh, if, if uh, the models are confirmed or not. So I try to understand uh, the wind situation. And uh, I start, I'm hoisting my mainsail, so I start to check if the buttons that I choose uh, is good or not. And then I start uh, to understand which, uh, which tuning I'm going uh, to use. And uh, yes, I think it's really important, uh, uh, don't lose time, you know, because in these classes, we, you don't have a lot of time to practice. So every minute uh, before the race is really important. So while I'm going to the race course, I'm 
I'm trying to to set the balls and be ready to start with the first lineup. Yeah, I think that's really huge because I as soon as we run the committee boat on the race course, I want to go right into confirming that it looks right. So I'll, I'll look up at the main right after we trim in kind of like just this shot we're seeing here in this photo in the presentation. And then I'm, I'm very visual. So I like to kind of go through a checklist of things I look at specifically on the main to make sure I, I'm in the right ballpark. And I kind of start with those, uh, the overbend wrinkles or the speed wrinkles that you can kind of see down towards the bottom of the main at the left. And the very bottom one, just in the picture that kind of comes back into that, the window on the mainsail, I, I like to see that just to that middle or the back of the mainsail. And that kind of makes, you know, that's the first check to make sure that I've got the, the rig tune in the right ballpark. And, and then I can kind of work my way up and look at that sort of right near that J70 logo, that number three batten, and just make sure it's not too deep or, or too flat. And that confirms I got the right battens. I've got enough bend up there. You can see in this photo, it's, it's pretty flat, but I think that's a good look for a lot of conditions. Um, and that, you know, that, that gets me right where I need to be and can kind of check the head stay sag as a part of that as well. But I think we were talking, Julia, you've got some other visuals you check on as well to make sure you're uh, in the right rig tune before you get racing, right? Yeah, you know, we we are we do more or less, we are on the same page, I can say. And uh, uh, when I when I check um, the first part of the lineup, you know, I'm going to check the, my mainsail and uh, I look especially the area between the J70 logo and the sail number. Then uh, I use the two leech telltales and uh, I think that are use, really useful to understand the twist. And uh, as you said, it's really important, in my opinion, the triangle between the mast and the boom to understand uh, uh, if the bend of your mast is correct, uh, uh, to understand uh, if the if the bottom part of the mainsail, the dip, is uh, is good or not. And uh, for example, the amount of backstay and of bang uh, that you are using is good, or you have to change something. Sometimes you you know you are speaking about fine tuning. So every time, I don't know you, but every time I try to adjust, just half turn, one turn, but to adjust uh, uh, my tuning uh, to, the, to the weather condition. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, and I think all that is, is really important um, to look at and, and get it all set up. So both of you now have talked about what you look for, but now I think the next question is, is how do you get there and what controls you have available to you to, to make this happen? So... You know, Zeke, when you're looking at this, you know, what, what are the options you have and how do you like to use those controls to make these adjustments? Yeah, well, that's, it's kind of a really reason why I really love sailing the J70 class. You get to pull on a lot of strings as the mainsail trimmer. You're kind of sitting there and your legs in. You've got access to, uh, to the main sheet, the traveler, the backstay, the vang. You can kind of bark about the Cunningham, the jib halyard, and all the jib sheets. So there's a lot, a lot going on for sure. And it's really imperative to know what to adjust first. And for me, it's the most important thing is the main sheet. There's no question about it. It's the, the biggest impactor of, you know, the boat balance and, uh, you know, how much power is in the boat and, and all that. And it's just so imperative, imperative to be adjusting it all the time. I can, you know, sometimes I can remember seeing guys going up wind uh, and I look at the main trimmer and the, the main sheet's in the cleat and the, the, the rope's on the ground. And you're, I just don't understand how those guys can, can get up wind without adjusting the main sheet a ton. So the main sheet's in my hand, constantly going in, in and out. Um, and the next thing that I adjust the most would be the backstay, I think for sure. It's, um, and it, it, it's just such a big control over everything. It's a, it's kind of controls both the jib and the main. Um, I like being able to pull backstay on because it, it really flattens out the whole profile of the sails and kind of creates less drag as you go through, uh, the puffs and the lulls. So it's just such a big impactor. And the, the traveler, I, I don't adjust as much. I try to look at the traveler as sort of a gross tune or a bass tune, um, unless it's kind of moderate breeze and really puffy. Um, I don't adjust it that much. I try to get it in, in the right ballpark and then adjust the main sheet and the, and the backstay more. Um, in fact, I think I probably adjust the Vang even more so than I do the Traveler in a, in a perfect world. So that's kind of the order that I adjust things. Uh, Julia, I know we have a couple different opinions on the Vang maybe, but would you agree on the main sheet and the backstay? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And uh, and uh, about the main sheet and the backstay, and uh, I can say that what I love about uh, you know to cover the main sail trimmer role is that you have to be really active during uh, during all the race. You know, you can you you can't stop in uh, and take a rest. You have always uh, to work uh, uh, to to make the the boat fast. And uh, yeah, probably the reason I'm I in my background I I'm a four seventy sailor, so I love play with the with the mainsail sheet so first of all 
the controls that I use more is the is the main sheet. I really work uh, uh, during all the all the regatta with the main sheet, and I can say that uh, I probably I could happen that during an upwind I never put it in the in the cleat. So mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. And um, the second two controls are the backstays and the main traveler. Uh, I can say both, but uh, yeah, probably a little bit more the backstay compared to the main traveler as a frequency to use it. And um, after that, uh, there is the um, there is the, the the Vang, then I can say the Auto, and then the Cunningham. So this is uh, uh, more or less the uh, my my approach and uh, the way that I use the controls. I I have um, I I have a sign on my on my main sheet. So I have a mark, and uh, I'm. I can say that I have marks more or less everywhere <laughs> on the boat. So I try to have a marks on the main sheet. I have marks on the van. I have the marks on the auto. I think that uh, uh, is uh, are really helpful. And uh, I'm not saying that while I'm sailing, I'm looking where I am with the with the mark of my main sheet. Okay, but uh, is I think that could be a good reference also to understand the difference between you know the flat water condition or the wavy one, and could be an help have all these marks uh, in the tough moment, you no, know, in the crucial moment of the regattas, like uh, uh, just to accelerate after the start uh, or while you are rounding the mark. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, in this in this moment, uh, it's uh, it could be an help, you know. And uh, I love uh, I love put a lot of marks on my boat. I don't know deep what. Julia, you yeah, yeah, Julia, you sounded defensive right off the bat on the main sheet. Like I'm gonna just attack you on your main sheet mark, and I'm I'm definitely gonna do that. I, <laughs> and I, I sometimes get in trouble with my teams because I, you know, I'm like you, Julia. I like to have everything marked on the boat so that you can adjust the jib sheet and say put the jib sheet to six or put the, you yeah. know, bring the Cunningham down to four. And then they look back and they're like, your main sheet is just a rope with nothing on it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's true. For me, I I've used the, the mark on the main sheet and it's a good reference, but for me, it's just a little distracting. I, I just think the main sheet is moving so much, so much of the time, so often, as you said, it's never in the cleat. And I just kind of become comfortable with the visual checks in my head. I, I look here, then I look here, you know, starting with the, the jib telltales and then the bottom part of the main and the leech of the main, I know what to check and kind of what I want it to look like. And I think there's just so much variability and how the, the height of the boom might change sometimes, uh, depending on your rig setting that that mark on the main sheet, it just kind of distracts me a little bit and can give me what's not perfect information. But generally, I mean, I like the idea of having repeatable settings and everything else is marked on the boat. That's just my personal style. I don't like the, the main sheet mark. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, okay. that totally makes sense that, um, I mean, both of you have different styles of doing it, but I think that's what's really cool is both of you are very successful in, you know, being main trimmers on these boats and both of you do it differently, but have really good results. I think it's a good thing to show that there's not one way to do it and that everyone kind of operates differently and gets good results. So I think it's, it's important to know, but um, in moving forward here, so you guys are getting ready for the race day. It's a light air race day. We got two boats here, light air. Um, you know, I'd love to hear, you know, Zeke talk about what he thinks about light to moderate air. And as it gets windier, we'll talk about it more. You're setting the sail up, just some clues you're looking for and, and tricks to the boat as you're doing it. Yeah, I think when it's light air, the key is getting enough power in out of your sails that you're able to pressurize the weather rail. By that, I mean getting bodies to windward. You know, nothing, nothing changes to depower sails or flatten sails until you're able to get body weight up on the weather rail and flatten the boat out. And that translates that pressure into the keel and we're starting to get some flow over the keel and the boat can really start moving. So when bodies are in, I'm thinking about getting the most power for sure. And again, starting with your rig tune and being confident in your rig tune and your jib leads and, uh, and all that is, is step one. But once we're setting up the main, for sure I go traveler all the way up to the top of the bar and we get that question sometimes, you know, is it okay to have the boom a little bit to weather? And I think, yes, I think the answer is, yeah, the, the traveler can be all the way at the top. It seems to not really slow the boat down very much because it's putting power and putting return into the bottom part of the main so that the top part of the main can be pretty twisted open. Like that picture on the right, the main's a little bit more twisted open and that's gonna let the boat uh, really accelerate. So, and I try to, um, you know, a good visual for me when the traveler is so high up, when it's all the way up like that, 
you have to think about the main sheet now is doing two things. One, it's bringing the boom up to weather and then it's pulling the boom down. And it's only when you start pulling the boom down that it's gonna close the leech. And I actually use that as a good visual clue of kind of when to stop pulling the main sheet in when the traveler is in this all the way up position. Traveler all the way up and then pull enough main sheet on that the boom's coming up at you to weather. And, and as soon as it starts getting pulled down, that's a good sign that you're starting to close the leech, which probably isn't great. But um, I don't, Julie, do you pull your traveler all the way to the top or are you the, the boom center line kind of guy? Yeah, I think that um, you say one thing is really important. I think in the light wind condition, you need power, you know, because one of your goals is to have the, the crew as soon as possible on the rail. So you're looking for power, you're looking for speed. And um, the way to, to, to have it, I think is, uh, okay, I, I sail with the main traveler all the way up. I have no backstay. Uh, I'm managing the twist of the sails, as you said, with the, with the main sail sheet. And, um, and let me add that in this case, in the light wind condition, I think it's really, really important. Okay, it's not just a main trimmer job, but it's the, it's the job of the main trimmer speak a lot with the jib trimmer also, you know, to have the, to have, to have the speed and to accelerate. So I think that you have to be really active with the jib trim in this condition. And uh, uh, to jump in the role of the main sail trimmer is not just a matter of trim the sails, but it's just a matter also to manage the, the crew. So press the boat every time that the puff is coming, try to accelerate. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, these are the keys for, uh, for a good speed in light wind. And uh, yes, the twist is your friend in this condition. No? So uh, I think that you have to be really careful to manage the, the right twist on the mainsail. And I think that we can analyze the difference in these two pictures. On the picture on the left uh, is the, you know, the, the wind is really light, while on the right, maybe there are a couple of knots more. And uh, probably is the, we are seeing the crossover when you need just the twist to accelerate. And when you start to close a little bit, probably in the picture on the right, you can close just a little bit more the, the main and you, st you are starting to use more just to point at 10% of the backstay. So to have more return also, and you have to rebalance a little bit, you know, the, the mix between the backstay and the main cell sheet and the main travel. What do you think? You agree on that? Yeah, well, I think I, I definitely do agree. I think you're hitting on the right points. I'm curious about how you you brought up the backstay, which is a really good good thing to talk about right now, and making sure that it can be loose enough. I think in the light air, so that it's not it's not only about the mainsail shape, but it's about the headstay sag, and it's really important yeah. in light air to be able to get enough headstay sag that the jib can be powered up, and ultimately it helps the boat point once the boat's powered up. But so, what do you look for on your backstay gross gross adjustment? in the light stuff to make sure that it's overall set up loose enough when it's light like this. Yeah, you know, I think that the gross backstay is a really important topics in our role and especially in the J70, you know, so we can discuss about the light wind, the medium and the strong in a different way. I think that most important things, however, when I, I wait uh, just to give you a feedback. Um, I wait until uh, the starting procedure to adjust it, you know, because I want to really be sure to have all the information about the wind until the last moment. Uh, so in the light air condition, I'm speaking about the condition on the left, uh, on the left picture. I I want to be sure to have the maximum backstay ease, you know, uh, and I'm not going to use it probably during this condition. At the same time, I know that if the wind starts to increase, I need to work a little bit on the backstay. So uh, I need to adjust it and find a compromise between the, the condition. Uh, at the same time, I think that it's, you know, then we are going to say with more wind, more wind. And then another, another thing is the strong wind condition. So in light wind, we are checking to have enough uh, at the sag, you know? So you want, uh, want all the at the sag possible. And uh, on the totally other side, in strong wind, you need to play hard with the backstay and you have to be comfortable to play with it. So yeah. the gross, you know, the, I think the trim of the of the gross backstay is uh, is really important, and you have to be careful before the start. Yeah, I think that's totally right, and we'll talk about the heavier backstay gross for a second. But again, getting back to me, I'm just a vis I'm visual. I like to kind of have things to check off on the visual front, and uh, the the blocks in on the backstay that hang, you know, underneath the the ferrule. 
I think that's that's the gauge that I use in the light air to make sure that uh, the gross is loose enough is if those blocks are hanging down, you know, eight inches or even a foot, then I know that it's maximum loose. And I still have enough play to kind of snug some tension on if some waves are coming or something, but I make sure that it's eased enough. So if, if the backstay is too tight, those blocks are gonna sit all the way at the top of the split right underneath the ferrule. Yeah. And that's a sign that you're probably, you're, you're pulling backstay on at that point. So you need to loosen the gross enough in the light air uh, so that the blocks will hang, you know, 10 inches down or so. And if we, if we move on, I think, to some heavier air setup uh, in the next slide, we're able to see, um, you know, how important it is to pull the backstay on tight. And for yeah. me, like, I, I, I think that this is the most, if you look across the board, this is where a lot of teams have a, a huge opportunity to improve their heavy air sailing is by getting the backstay gross tune tight enough. And uh, do you, do you have a, like a fancy way of adjusting the backstay gross or do you have just knots and half hitches like me? Yeah, I just have knots and uh, yeah. <laughs> I can say that I, before the start to try to use the body the the speed everything yeah. to to trim hard before the start you know because then it's important that you you feel comfortable you can't fight during the help wind and strong wind to to trim more backstay you know yeah this is my is my opinion then of course uh, it's different if it's a classic strong wind condition you have to trim hard the cross backstay but uh, be careful if the wind drop the yeah for sure and i think you you may have sort of chopped up a little bit there in the beginning of that talk Julio but I think we were we were laughing before about how how hard we work to get that backstay on the gross tune as hard as we can and I've seen a lot of really cool um, adjustable setups on the dock that leave me very envious at times but I just I keep coming back to you know a rope that goes up through the ferrule and you can just pull as much down as you can and put some slip knots in it because boy if it's blowing 20 25 knots I get two guys back there and we hang on the backstay to the point where we get the ferrule all the way down to the to the corner of the transom so we can't pull it any tighter yeah and um you know for sure that's helping to pull enough backstay on but what i like about it is it's it's making it easier to adjust you know it's not just about getting it all the way to max tight but it's about then being able to ease it off you know 10 percent and pull it back on the more you have on the gross tune the easier it is to adjust the fine tune and i'm either I'm just not that strong or I don't like to work that hard or something, but the easiest I can have it uh, is just the boat's going to go faster. And of course you need to be in conditions where you know, you're not going to need to blow the backstay. But if you're certain that you're in max backstay conditions, I'd say whale on it as hard as you can. So yeah, in looking yeah. at these photos, yeah. you know, in the first set, we were talking about when the boat needs power, right. And what you guys look at to get the boat power. Now, obviously we're talking about when it's windy, the boat needs less power. It, the boat doesn't seem to have a sweet spot where it's perfect. It's either underpowered or overpowered, right? And um, <laughs> here's a bunch of photos where they're overpowered. So when you guys are the main trimmer and you're in overpowering conditions, what are a few things you do to keep the boat on its feet? Um, in both of these photos, it's pretty windy, but if you notice the main isn't luffing and that's because it's trimmed properly. So you know, maybe Julio, I think you're probably in a few of these photos here. You know, what are a couple of clues that you look at to keep the main trimmed properly when the boat is overpowered? Yeah, I still, I still remember the moment of this, uh, of these photos on, on the left. We were, um, we were last year on guard and the, the practice days before the European Championship. It's uh, quite windy, it's uh, 18 to 20 knots. And uh, of course, you have to choose the right uh, uh, tuning set. And, uh, and then speaking about the controls, uh, as we discussed before, uh, the backstage can help you a lot. And um, so I try to, to choose the right rig tune, uh, thinking about to go to sail the regatta with more or less the 70-80% of the backstage on. And I think that this could be a good, uh, um, a good way to understand if you have the right, uh, the right tuning. Uh, say that then I use uh, of course uh, if you see the picture on the left is a uh, windy and flat water condition so the goal was to sail with a quite flat profile and uh, maybe a little bit closer compared to the standard and um, uh, as, as I say before I'm I love playing a lot with the main ship so uh, I I sail with the main traveler more or less close to the middle 
maybe some centimeters uh, on windward. In this case, I was uh, yes, like 10 centimeters more on the lead, on the on the middle. Uh, I remember this tuning test. We were sailing with uh, Infant Terrible on leeward on us, so I was sailing with a little bit more mainsail, mainsail uh, travel, and. Uh, in other, I think that in this case, we have to control also the Cunningham. Uh, remember that when you are close to finish your backstay, you know, so the falls start to, to appear on the, on, the, on the mainsail, you can trim a little bit more the, the Cunningham and you can add some more backstay. So this could be a really good, uh, a really good tool to use. Uh, another thing, uh, look in this picture, is about uh, the combination between the mainsail and uh, the jib trim. In this moment, I think that it's really, really important the communication between the mainsail trimmer and the jib trimmer. And I'm speaking about the Hinaul, Hinaul Arch sheet. Uh, Hinad, uh, what else? Uh, uh, we didn't discuss about the buttons, but of course, uh, uh, comparing the, the the photos of the light wind and compared to this one, uh, we change also the the buttons. You know, so here we are sailing with the ten two hundred and thirty, uh, and probably in the in the picture before we the teams were sailing with the second one. Uh, in other, just to and then uh, uh, I give uh, you know I, it's a zig tours so speaking <laughs> about the picture, but uh, uh, just to I think that could be interesting analyze these two picture because uh, uh, the waves con the, the the waves are different. You know I think that is a a, cl a classic uh, flat water spot uh, on the left with the flat wind, and there is a choppy condition on the right. Uh, the, your goal is a little bit different, you know. I think that in, on the right you need uh, a more power for profile and a little bit more open, uh, and you have to think about the average of the speed. You, you have to be focused uh, on the choppy that are coming and uh, really be focused on the average speed of, of the boat. And I, what do you think, Zik? Uh, what do you want to add? Yeah, well, I think you said a lot of really, really good stuff, but a couple points that you made that I like to kind of come away with were, um, you know, putting the, the traveler you mentioned was not all the way in the middle, but sort of, I think of it in terms of car lengths, uh, so lengths of the yeah. car as it slides up the traveler, and I, I'm on the same page with you there. I generally like to leave it one car length up from the center when you're in this max maximum windy condition and you're trying to depower. And one of the reasons I think that that works pretty good is it allows you to actually pull the jib in a little harder or maybe carry some more in-hauler up, up the range of conditions. Um, and I think that, that that can be good because if, if the traveler goes any lower, then you get more return from the jib into the bottom of the main and it starts to blow up or kind of bubble and luff a little bit more. Um, and I also really liked what you said about the how you use the Cunningham to sort of control the the folds you call them or the wrinkles as we as as we refer to them here the overbend wrinkles that you start to get because again for me it's it comes down to the visual on what I see on the mainsail and um, when you start pulling the backstay really really hard you start getting those inversion wrinkles where the it, the sail literally as you said starts folding and getting flat and sort of inverting and by pulling the Cunningham on you're able to put the shape back in the sail where you want it so having that right combination of enough backstay on and enough Cunningham on to keep the sail looking smooth. That's the difference between the boats that go up wind with their sail flapping and the, and the boats that can have it just kind of catching. And you know, you just sort of use the main sheet going in and out to sort of catch the sail, keep it full um, and use it as like a lever to keep the boat flat and try to drive on as steady a heel angle as you can. I think this is uh, all really uh, huge points on sailing when it's windy. I know that's one of the things that's really difficult for people. So we got a question from Brian Keene, who's watching this right now, uh, for both of you, actually, in asking uh, how you guys adjust and trim the vang in these conditions, as, you know, it's obviously a crucial control when it's windy. And uh, I'd be curious to hear if, Julio, if you want to jump in first, um, how you decide how much vang to put on and, and what, it, what you look at to make those adjustments. Uh, okay, first of all, I think that uh, is another good matter to speak about the role on board. And uh, for example, I'm not, I don't know Zeke, but uh, during the upwind, uh, Michele, the tactician, is um, is the is the crew involved in to to trim the the bank. Uh, so the discussion is between me and him about uh, the amount of bank to use. And in this condition, for example, on the on the left, we were totally bang on, so hundred percent. 
of the of the van gear. You mean does that mean Julio? Does that mean 100 percent as hard as that as they can pull it? That's exactly. as they cannot exactly. pull it any harder. Interesting. Exactly. Yeah. This is uh, this is uh, the the picture on the left. Mm -hmm. And uh, personally, I like because uh, in this way I can play more with the main sheet, you know, and I have more the control of the of the leech. Uh, if we can, uh, we have some picture in the in the in the PPT, and uh, I think that uh, if you are, you know, if the wind increases during the during the the race, you are not uh, touring for that. I think that you have to be careful because you can start trimming, trimming, trimming the bank, but then the end you have to ease again a little bit the bank because it's not you are going to bend also too much the the mast in the bottom part and you and you are going to lose totally the the mainsail. So the mainsail start to flap, became really nervous, and yeah. this is not what you want. You want always, in my opinion, in the strong wind condition, uh, now the main is not flapping, but could could happen. And I think that it's important that not start to flap really nervous, but uh, a kind of, you know, I, I have to manage it a little bit. So you can have uh, the back wind on the main, you can lose sometimes the main, but have to be really, really controlled. That's interesting, Julia. We're going to have to do some more racing against each other and figure out which one of us is faster up wind in this breeze. Because I, I, the thought of pulling on the, the Vang 100% of how much I can pull scares the daylights out of me. I think it, uh, I think you get to a point <laughs> Um, with a deck stepped mass like this, where it starts impacting the head state tension a bit, and you're just kind of over bending the bottom, like you were talking about, and, and actually maybe even losing some head state tension. And I just don't think it's the best tool to be trying to invert the main. I guess I feel like if I pull it that hard, the bottom of the main is going to be up to windward. You know, it's going to be totally gone. And I sort of like the idea of having some. A little bit yeah. more shape down low. I mean, I think you still you would definitely want it flat, but I don't think fully inverted there, and uh, and then keep some some power and some leech control. So I just pull it. I pull it on for sure. As soon as we're in overpowered condition, I take the slack out, so I'm able to ease the main sheet without losing the leech. And I'll go another few inches from there. And actually, I pull it myself because we sail four people, and the two people in front of me are legs out. Um, and I'll just reach forward and, and pull the van back myself. But I, and I pull some tension on it, but I basically, as soon as I start seeing the really, the big overbend wrinkles in the bottom of the main as a result of the van getting tight, that's when I, that's when I'll stop. But I don't know, I, I, I used to pull it harder and I kind of try to adapt. So it's interesting to hear you talk about that. Maybe I need to try that. No, I, I think it's, it's as you said. So, sorry, I lost you for a second, guys. I'm I'm here again. I think that it's really interesting to see the difference between you know the way to sail the boat, and uh, I think that it's also why the J70 is a great Did we lose? I, we might have lost Julio for a second then, there. Oh. Uh, as you seen in the, <laughs> I'm here again. <laughs> yeah. And you know, you, we are in direct, so it could happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, no, I was saying that it's interesting to see the differences yeah. between, uh, you know, the way to sail the boat. And this is why I think that J70 is, is the boat great to sail and compete. And uh, in the photos, what I can say is that the bottom part, of, however, of the main was uh, quite good, you know. With yeah, the that's, true. So, that's true, that's uh, true. No, so I think that uh, uh, we were sailing with, uh, you know, all the van on, but with the shape in the bottom that I totally agree, you need it to sail in the strong wind condition, because if not, you don't have nothing on the rudder. So it's difficult, it's really difficult to help the boat. To well, and it's also it. not for nothing, uh, but it's different. I, think it, I was going to say it's different. It's a little different where you're pulling the van from. If it's your forward person, they probably can't physically pull as much from as a person that's in the back of the boat pulling 100%. So maybe that's where we have a little bit of difference maybe. as well. Maybe, but Michele is, uh, you know, he's sitting yeah. in the thing. Probably glass, stronger so than me. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. That next time I introduce you to yeah, Michele, don't. we'll see. I feel safe happens. across the Atlantic Ocean <laughs> from, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think that we are going to, to, to do another webinar more about... Uh, the yeah. the sail design and the tuning you know because if not we can stay to discuss about just about the van at the there bottom part of the main for all the night i think but of course the, the lower is the key probably no right right yep. the amount of lower that you need 
Yeah. And the crew wait, but it's another page again and it <laughs> whole, became too long. <laughs> it's a whole other thing. And it could also just be your outhaul tension too, right? right. I mean, depending on how much you need. Yeah. But so in thinking about this, you know, obviously the main trimmer, the primary job is to trim the sail, right? But also, you know, when you're trimming the main, you have other roles on the boat. And here's a, a good photo of Zeke sailing with John Heaton in Miami at the Midwinters. And they had a really great regatta. And, you know, the main trimmer has to interact with, you know, the, the whole team, but especially the jib trimmer and the helmsman. So I think this would be a good time for Zeke maybe to, to start talking about some of the things that he chats about with the jib trimmer and the driver. And we can go through in different conditions uh, what discussions you both have with different members of the crew. So I don't know, Zeke, if you want to jump in and yeah, well, you're off here. Uh, yeah, for sure. It's definitely a really f reason that the, uh, that the main trimmer position is so fun. I mean, my, my most favorite thing about it is I get to keep my legs inside so my feet don't get wet. That's the number one reason I like trimming main. But you get to be so involved with the whole team dynamic. You're kind of, you know, you're driving the bus in terms of, um, you know, a lot of times where you're going, but also just the, the communication between the helmsman and the, the forward crew and yourself. And, and you also get to be involved in, in the jib trim. And I think it's really important that the main trimmer is involved in the jib trim. And you know, kind of like we talked about at the beginning where the big picture stuff starts with the rig tune. For the jib trim, it really starts with, you know, having good marks. So we definitely have a ton of marks on the boat for the jib sheet, the in-hauler. And so we've, you know, we've built a bit of a matrix there so that we know where to, where the kind of starting point is. And generally we'll get the jib trimmer to get the, the sheets to the starting point. And then, you know, he'll check it out and make sure that, you know, they like what they're seeing. And then I'll jump down and check it out and make sure that I kind of like it and that it's setting up this, you know, to accomplish the same goal that I'm trying to accomplish with the main. And I just think it's really important to then communicate if you're going to make a change. You know, I might say I'm going to ease the, ease the lure a half a number and, and pull the inhaler in a half a number from where you were and let's just see how we go. And, um, you know, from their position, the, the jib trimmer is looking out and kind of giving the relatives of how we're going. So after I'll make a change and I'll physically do it, I'll reach forward and do it uh, a lot of the time so they can stay hiking or wherever they're supposed to be. And then we'll make that change and they'll be able to say, yeah, yeah, that was, you know, we're, we're higher, but we're, we're losing it here and we need to put the bow down a little bit. So um, definitely being involved with the jib trimmer and having that discussion is really an important role for the main trimmer. Yeah. And, and, you know, Julio, I'd love to have you jump in here, you know, in, in talking about how you interact with the driver and, and, and your jib trimmer, frankly, but here's some photos, light air, right? The discussion's different with each person on the boat, depending on the wind range. So let's just talk about with, with both of you, but we'll have Julio kick it off with, what are you guys talking about from your seat in the house of main trimmer in light winds? And how would that discussion go? You know, you know, I, I jumped a little in the discussion about the communication on board. And uh, as Zeke said, I think that uh, the main trimmer role of course, it's based on to trimming the mainsail, but uh, uh, thinking about the communication on board, I think that it's a really, it's really, really important because, um, and this is why I here uh, uh, to say with uh, Calvi and Petit Terrible as a main trimmer, uh, because I was really linked with uh, the, all the other guys in the team. And especially, for example, with the tactician, I have a really good relationship with Michele uh, Pauletti that I really admire as a sailor and, and uh, as a man. But I'm saying that because I, I think if you have to consider, in my opinion, that the main sail trimmer is exactly in the middle between the, the husband and the, rest of the, and the rest of the team. So you have to communicate, of course, uh, uh, during all the regatta, giving the support to the husband. But at the same time, you have to be ready to speak with the jib trimmer, with the genaker trimmer, and be ready. You know, sometimes the, the tactician could ask uh, some feedbacks, uh, some information and advice about, you know, or uh, confirm about the situation. So I think that uh, he needs to be focused 100% of the, on the speed of the boats, but uh, have always uh, under control the big picture uh, on what is going on in the, in the race. And uh, at the same time, always speaking about we got to get better, better internet about the there. communication. Also, to you know, to to push the. Sorry, <laughs> we lost you again for a second there. So, uh, okay, sorry. I would, uh, where you where you arrived? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Zeke. No, that's all right. You were just you were kind of starting to talk about the communication to the helmsman specifically uh, in the light air stuff and kind of the I think 
the kind of the yeah. I was yeah, curious. No, I, I was going to ask you what your specific uh, language is. I know you're kind of direct and you like to limit the the phrases that come out of your mouth. So what like yeah, what kind of words yeah, do you say? Uh, let me say let me say that um, with Claudia is a it's a um, start to start to have a, a really good career in the J seventy. Mm -hmm. So uh, she's a good driver and. Uh, uh, she had a, a start to have a, some trophies, you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah. so she know how to say the most of the in the most of the situation. So what I suggest, however, about the communication is that to be really simple, short and constant uh, during the race. So, uh, you know, I think that you can use uh, uh, something like uh, up one, down one or press the boat or uh, not to lower. So something like this. Uh, then what we add uh, with Claudia is uh, uh, give us support uh, some, with uh, you know some words like uh, a set of waves is coming, press a little, or uh, something like flat water. You can point a little bit more, and we work also on the WMG. So fast WMG, high WMG, and uh, um, or if you know the average, average speed, if there, we are going to say in the turbulent uh, area. Yeah. So we, I think that we had something about the standard communication that uh, I really suggest that to be really simple and clear. Uh, speaking about the light wind, so, sorry, Alan, if I spoke a little also about no, the communication you're, and no, you're, you're I going great. was out of, <laughs> out of the topics of the picture. But uh, uh, in this picture, I think that is interesting. Uh, so in the, in the first picture, uh, there is a, you know, I'm I'm trimming the mainsail and the backstay in the same times. You know, and was uh, is interesting because we said that in the first part of the webinar, you know, Zeke, that we are uh, always playing with the. Oh, I think we lost them here again. Controls uh, and try to 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 reset. Uh, sorry, uh, do you hear me? Yeah, you're going a little bit in and out, but um, yeah. So I, I play with the main sail sheet and the backstays in the in the same times. Uh, about the communication, I'm I think that the main sail role have to imagine to the main sail trimmer have to imagine to steer the boat. So I'm looking forward and looking the details, and uh, in the same times I'm I'm uh, I'm giving the feedbacks to to Claudia. Um, here, Michele is also uh, trimming the jib. So it's always a balance between the jib trim and the mainsail trim. Uh, Looking at the picture number two, I think that it's interesting because I'm going in. You no, know? so we discussed that in the light wind condition, uh, the most active role probably is the main trimmer. So you can jump in, you can go totally forward, close to the cabin, you can jump back again, you can start hiking with the other guys of the crew in front of the winch. So you have to be really active and uh, uh, do that, you have to, to speak with Claudia because for example, there is, with the Hesman, because for example, it could be a drop you know, of the wind and you can jump, just uh, jump in and uh, the Hesman can go straight. It is just a kind of communication that you can have. Uh, the last picture again, I'm trimming the mainsail in the same time the jib trimmer is, is, is trimming the jib. So what I want to say is that it's really, really important uh, the balance between uh, the main and the jib and use the jib every time to accelerate. This is my feedback. I hope that you, <laughs> that I don't lose the connection <laughs> this time. No, but <laughs> if not, I, I, I'm going to send an email to everybody. So. <laughs> yeah. But I think this is also a good time, you know, for, for Zeke to jump in here and just, uh, you know, he's generally very quick and light air, um, you know, just a couple of things that he's focusing on and working with the driver, you know, to make sure that happens. Yeah, there are some some cool things, Julio, that you said, uh, for sure, like pulling the backstay and the main at the same time, you know, that's really important that when you, you pull the backstay on or ease the backstay, it has a really big impact on the leech. Um, but I like what you said about communicating with the helmsman and, and using repeatable language using the same words every time like you shouldn't say press one time and then say bear off another time you should just limit the amount of, of words that can mean the same thing just to simplify everything and make it really repeatable and don't yeah. forget to uh and you actually mentioned this before and i loved it don't forget to like just say positive stuff every now and then like the the drivers yeah. in this fleet are so focused and so dialed in they're just staring at these yarns on a white triangle for hours on end and for them to hear Hey, we're going really well. 
is like that can be the difference between you know a good race and a bad race so it's a good opportunity to just do that and um the last thing I, i'm glad you brought up the body weight position and how active you are i think in the light air it's it's really important to focus on getting the body weight forward and you you guys have a, an extra person as far as i can tell uh, but you you can hardly tell because you're so smushed up together and forward <laughs> Um, yeah. and, and what I like in that picture number two is how low you're able to get. I think oftentimes people forget that getting your bodies up out of the sky and pressed down low on the boat is really good for, um, you know, keeping the weight low to the boat is good, but also keeping your body, your shoulders out of the air is actually, it's, it makes a really big difference on the, uh, the, the drag in the air. So weight forward and weight low, I think is really important. That's what I'm thinking about for the light stuff. And it's all in an effort to get the keel working again. Like in the, all these photos, you guys are up on the rail, but when it's even lighter than this, I'll, I'll give the helmsman a, a specific goal to, to steer the boat to in terms of the telltale angle. I'll say it like, you know, if the weather telltale is ever straight back, you're too high. It should always be nervous. I'll describe it as nervous where you're just, you're always keeping pressure on the jib, trying to power the boat up as much as you can so that you can eventually get weight to the rail. And then you can think about sailing upwind a little bit more yeah I think I... Big, let, let, sorry let me add just one thing that uh, i'm really i really agree with you that uh, you have to be positive you know and never give up always pushing and this is your role i think and uh, let me say that another good communication is uh, and then that i use a lot while we are sailing the good angle because sometimes mm -hmm. you know you just say up one or down one but the risk is that to start to have a pendulum <laughs> Yeah. So it's really important also sometimes say good angle, go straight, good angle. And yeah, this is, yeah. uh, I think, really important to stay in the mood. Right. Or, or good, but good, but no lower. Good, but yeah, no higher. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I like that. That it means everything is going good. <laughs> right. Yeah. I just want to thank both of you for getting me in trouble. Uh, Josh, the guy I sailed with all winter saying, you know, I should take notes from you guys about how to be more positive in light air. So I, I really, really <laughs> appreciate both of you. Um, don't just think I, about for light air, Alan. Think about that for life. Well, just no, be but positive. Uh, just it's true. I agree. <laughs> but I, but I think the one thing that's important too in light air to remember, and I and I, you know, think about you know when I used to own a boat and steer, um, is the boat has really horrible feel in light air. So it, it's really easy for the boat to wander and kind of helping you know whoever's driving, not to over trim the main to give it feel, but kind of I don't want to say sympathize with their lack of feel on the rudder and light air is something that is pretty important for the main sheet trimmer to do i think so kind of going forward here you know now it's getting a little breezier everyone's down the rail hiking we're not maybe at full windy conditions yet but it's you know the boat's pressured up and now you're sailing so what are some of the communications you make and um you know some of the different discussions that you might have in this breeze versus uh you know really light air so i don't know zeke what, what would be some of the differences you see um, there's not a lot of like wildly different approaches. I mean, I'm still very visual and still want to get everything set up. So it looks right based on my tuning guide and, and all that. And, you know, generally here, you've got the weight up and you're starting to think about a heel, a specific heel angle. I think a lot of teams in this condition, you start kind of wanting, as you were saying, Alan, you want a little more feel to just feel better in this sort of, you know, moderate breeze. And a lot of teams sail around with too much lured heel as a result of that. So I definitely, this is where I start to really focus on a, on a specific heel angle. And I recommend a, an indicator if you don't have one, but there's a lot of good electronics out there that'll tell you the heel of your boat. And then you can give a target to not only the helmsman, but the crew as well. Cause I know when I would do legs out positions on the J70, I'm so guilty of leaning in cause I get nervous and I like, I want to heal the boat to lure and have it feel a little bit better, but it's just so bad. So having a, a heel angle target, I think is really, really good. And, um, I, you know, I, this is where you kind of start making decisions on how the wind uh, relates to the, to the waves a bit, because you can kind of make decisions on, do I want more power or less power? Uh, so, you know, sailing in 11 knots and dead flat water is very different than sailing in 11 knots and, you know, washing machine lake conditions in Chicago or something like that. So you can kind of start adding in well, it's 11 knots, but it's so lumpy, we're going to stay a little looser on the rig, or I'm going to sail with a little more traveler up and a little more twist for, you know, to get power that way. Um, so it starts to become quite dynamic uh, in this condition. There's a lot, lot more to think about, but um, what do you think about that, Julia? What, what's your, your go-to move for this moderate stuff? Yeah, probably is the most dynamic uh, situation, you know, is the situation where you have to adjust more the 
main traveler, the backstay and the and the main sheet and the van. You have to adjust everything uh, all the time, no? Because it mm. depends if the wave is coming, if it's flat water, if the path is coming. And uh, I think that uh, are the most probably the most difficult uh, uh, situation. <laughs> Let me say that uh, I use the mark on the main sheet, but uh, we are not using the healing angle. So it's one to one, you know, like, uh, and uh, yeah. my if healing angle so. are, are the, are the Mateo's legs. As you can oh. see in the, well, then, in it's, the, then it depends how cold the water is because he's not going to put his feet down yeah, there, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, could be, could be. No, but uh, let me say that in this condition, I think that it's also difficult because uh, you can change, uh, you can sail with two different WMG. So you can sail a little bit higher, maybe a little bit more healed, and you can, you can sail with the WMG, with the fast WMG, so with the boat a little bit flatter and going for speed. So it's a, a really the crossover between uh, between these two uh, VMG. In this three picture, I think that is interesting. There are three different situations and that change for the communication. You hearing him, Alan? The first oh, one is for the World Championship. Oh, sorry, That's I, okay. I'm here. Every you, were just, you were just starting <laughs> to talk about the first picture, I think. Okay, so you don't lose a lot. Yeah. So we were in Turkey sailing the World Championship. And uh, this was the situation where the communication with uh, Claudia was uh, if the set of waves was coming. And uh, I was asking to press more the boat, you know. So this is the kind of communication that we, we were doing. And uh, as you can see, I have the main sheet in my hands. And I'm trying to, to control the healing and the power of the boat, especially with the main sail sheet. In the in the picture number two is the situation where there are there is the turbulent wind, and I'm going to ask uh, uh, to Claudia uh, take an average angle, you know. So don't try to sail with a peak of speed, but uh, be careful on the average speed. That is really important. And uh, here we are. Oh, we might have lost we were in, a, in my two sales. Where you arrived. <laughs> <laughs> we're arrived here. Well, I, you know, something that you, you just said before we lost you, Julia, was talking about the average speed and not necessarily looking for yeah, the, yeah, the super uh, high uh, so speed. And... Yeah, so work on the average speed if the wind is turbulent. And, um, and, uh, and this is, these were the case. We were on Garda sailing... Uh, sailing uh, close to the rocks in, in, in Malchesine. And uh, the third picture is uh, again in Malchesine and uh, it was another situation where the mainsail trimmer had to, to work with the helmsman to choose the Libau tech. So it's another crucial moment where the communication is really important. And after a Libau tech, you have, uh, I think, to be really focused because you can sail immediately higher, no, because you want to kill the boat on wind or you, but you have to, however, keep the speed and work with the helmets to manage the, the situation. Yeah, I think we got to, yeah, I, that's a really good, really, really excellent point. I know we got to move on to the yeah. windier stuff, but one thing that, that I like Julio said that's really important, I thought was um, you managing your lanes becomes really, really important in that moderate stuff. So he was just talking about where to tack. But keep in mind that like with through all these different modes you can sail in in that condition, all the other boats are might not be in the same mode that you are in. So picking a yeah, good exactly. lane so that you know you can sail in your mode is really important because there's nothing worse than setting up in a spot you think you can live, but you got somebody to lure who's sailing healed over and and really, really high for you know a short period of time. So yeah. we actually have a good segue here. We just got a question uh, for someone, and I think it's appropriate for these windy photos. And uh, what they're asking is, you know, in the puffs. What is your, your first choice? Do you dump the main sheet first? Do you max backstay first? Do you dump the traveler? Is it a combination of things? So, uh, you know, the question really is when the big puffs come and it's really windy and you're trying to keep the boat on its feet, what is your go-to move and what do you do first? So I don't know if Zeke, if you want to jump yeah. in on that, what would be your, your first go-to move? I think it comes back to me, just like I said at the very beginning, the main sheet is the most direct impact, right? If you drop the main sheet, the boat's going to come to flat. Um, so the main sheet getting eased is really, really key. You just have to be prepared, right? So if it's hopefully if it's that big of a puff, you need to dump quickly. The vang is at least snugged or or pulled somewhere between 
zero and 100% of a fin sailor's strength. Uh, but the Vang <laughs> needs to be on so that you can do that big dump. And, um, you know, hopefully also the traveler is in a low enough position that it doesn't have to get, get really dumped. So I'm imagining we're talking about this in the sort of 14 to 18 range where the traveler is already close to the center. Um, but I will do the, the backstay and the main sheet at the same time a lot. And like right as the puff is hitting, it'll be backstay on and main going out. Um, you know, that's, that's going to be the most effective way to deal with a really big puff that hits in a hurry, assuming the traveler's all the way down if you, if, or in the center. Um, but if the traveler's up high, then you got to dump the traveler quick too. Yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, jumping into the discussion of to if the puff is coming, it depends uh, also by the WMG that you want to say. What we what we do with uh, with Claudia is uh, you always start with the idea to do 50-50, no, if the puff is coming. So I have to ease the mainsail, and she have to go a little bit higher yeah. while the puff is touching the boat. And uh, of course, if the call is to do a higher mode. She had, she had, I stay with a little bit more main in and she had to go a little bit higher to keep the healing angle stable. Mm -hmm. Vice versa, if you are going uh, in the fast mode, I say, okay, Claudia, don't change nothing. I'm going to manage the healing angle with the mainsail sheet. So I'm using more the mainsail and I try to go for speed. This is, I think that is interesting to understand how to manage if a puff is coming and touch your boat. And uh, about these three pictures, we were in uh, in Uruguay this winter, and uh, the first one is interesting, Zeke, because uh, it, it was the situation where we start in the medium, light medium hair, and then we finish the regatta with uh, 18 knots. So we we had we adjusted the you know more or less the tuning of the boat just to sail properly, and uh, you can see that there are some faults. Uh, the, there is a little bit of backwind on the on the mainsail. And but was a compromise between the the steering, the mainsail, uh, you know, shape, and the, and the jib trim. So we adjust the halyard of the jib. We adjust the in hour. We adjust uh, uh, all the all the controls just to try to sail properly and, however, with the correct healing angle. But uh, yes, as you can see, you can see the fold close to the close to the bottom part of the of the of the mainsail. And this is the condition where you want also put more canning on home just to, to work more with the backstay, you know? And if you see the backstay was the condition where it's really hard to trim because yeah. if you see the blocks start to be really low. Right. And, uh, and the other, the other photos is uh, this, I, I put the second one because was a mo it was a moment where we were crossing another boat. So with Claudia, one of the calls was uh, go for speed because you have to close the door. You know, because the call of Michele was go straight, so we try to avoid a lip out tack of the other boat. And um, the third one, and then it's your turn. <laughs> uh, the last, the last photo is, uh, I think, another interesting uh, photo to understand uh, how to play with the VMG during the upwind. We were uh, close to the left ley line. It was windy, and uh, we were one of the boat more on the left. Of the, on the race course so the the goal was to to go fast and close you know to close the the and put in the in the best places tactical place so uh, the call was go for speed and again you have to uh, to change a little bit the compromise between the way of steer the boat and the the way to to set the mainsail yeah that's you brought up a lot of really good points on how many variables there are and how many decisions you got to make as the main trimmer and, you know, trying to execute the game plan strategically, how to put the boat. Um, but I, you know, I think in this real windy, real windy stuff in terms of the setup, a big thing that I start thinking about, you know, we've talked a lot about the backstay and the, and the rig tune a little bit and adjusting for, for puffs, but I'm pretty curious about the, I'm always curious about the weight placement. Cause I think generally speaking, the J70 really likes to have weight far forward. And for you guys sail with five, I'm used to sailing with four. So there's going to be some big variables there. But um, in terms of in this big breeze, when to start moving the weight back, I think is a pretty difficult choice to make. And, uh, you know, for sure, it's really dependent on the waves. But I, I like to have somebody that's in charge of that on the boat. So I, I definitely have some say on it. But um, the forward most person kind of drives the bus for us on when it's time to start scooting back. And 
when I have to start straddling the winch, unfortunately, or sitting behind the winch and get really uncomfortable. Um, but I just, you know, don't forget how big of a, a tuning element your weight positioning is and, you know, where your bow knuckle is, is slamming into the waves. And I don't, do you have any tells that tell you when it's time to really scoot, scoot back? You know, it's, it's difficult to say. I, I, I'm the guys involved in, you know, that uh, on board and I'm the guys that call the way, the way back the weight back or the weight forward you know mm -hmm. uh, I, I really like to move it in the different uh, condition as you can say as you can see in the picture I'm uh, behind the winch and also Michele the tactician is really close to the winch too so we are quite way back on the on the rail I in, in my opinion also the girls you know we sail in five so in the light wind spot the the girls the bowman uh, Rossella uh, sail close to the mast uh, and when it become windy, start to move uh, back and back and back. And this really, you know, I think that play with the crew weight, it's really, really important to manage, uh, to manage uh, how to sail the boat. Yeah, for sure. I, I couldn't agree with you more. So uh, before we move on, we had a couple questions that I want to just throw at you guys. They don't need to be long, elaborate answers, but I think it's important. So uh, one of the questions was when it's windy, obviously how the jib interacts with the main is important, especially when it comes to the in-hauler. So, uh, you know, Zeke or Julio, either of you can start off. We'll have Zeke start off. So what is your discussion with the jib trimmer on when they need to release the in-hauler, where you like to set the in-hauler, um, and how you kind of make the decision of, of keeping the main, you know, from not blowing up because of the in-hauler? Yeah, well, the amount of inhaler you can carry for sure depends a little bit on which jib you're using. Um, but I like to carry inhaler for as long as we can. And we pretty much set it at a point when it's really windy, we set it at a point where um, it's in the cleat. The weather sheet is in the cleat at a point that the it's taut on the clue, but it's not really pulling the clue to windward. And then there, you, you know, the jib trimmer and the bow person will be pulling it from the block on the weather side of the boat. So they'll have to sit there with it up in their arm for a bit, for a lot of it when we have the inhaler on. And they, which <laughs> talk about needing to be strong. Um, but that way they can be playing it because I think if the boat gets flat and you can pull the main really hard, you can pull the inhaler on and get that depth in the bottom and, and that really helps the boat go, but then they can dump it if a big puff comes. Um, the reason that's really important to do is because if you don't blow the inhaler and a puff comes on, you ease the main and now the main is eased down to the point where it's in the slot, the gap between the leech of the jib and the belly of the main. And the main's gonna blow up a lot faster. It's gonna start luffing a lot more and it's gonna really unbalance the boat because the jib is gonna be pulling the bow down, telling the bow to turn downwind at the same time that the boat's healing to leeward. And it, it makes the boat really difficult to, stay, to sail and really, really unbalanced. So it's important that the jib goes out with the main at that point, just to the point where the inhaler's no longer on. The other important thing there is that if the inhaler stays really tight, the tighter your inhaler is, the more head stay sag you're going to put into the boat. And there's nothing worse than seeing a boat going upwind with the main flogging, heeled over, full jib from the inhaler on, and a bunch of head stay sag. It's just the exact opposite way to sail upwind efficiently. So being able to control the inhaler to the point where it's on as much as those guys can pull it on through the block, and then they can dump it in a hurry to go to zero inhaler is really important. And you know, if we're overstood on a ley line, that's the first thing to go is the inhaler is going to go off so we can ease yeah. the main out and uh, we can yeah. put the bow down easy. Well, thanks. I mean, we've, uh, as you see, we've gone to the next slide. We're, we're, we've already crossed the one hour barrier here. You guys are, are machines when it comes to giving out info. So um, one of the things I wanted to do um, next week, we're having a talk on downwind sailing on J70 Monday with uh, Tim Healy and, and Rory and, uh, what I want to get from you guys, though, as the main trimmer, what are one to two points? I want this to be really quick that you guys focus on. You know, it could be planing. It could be the wing on wing mode. It could be displacement mode. But just one or two things that you work on when it comes to just trimming the main, not necessarily crew positioning or dynamics or anything like that. Just mainsail trim. What are two points, quick points that you guys focus on? So we'll have Julio go and then Zeke will go and then we'll kind of wrap this thing up here a little bit. Uh, just really quickly, I think uh, in the light to medium uh, condition, I'm focused. Uh, you know, the the main is open. I'm really focused uh, on the on the crew weight. So I try to work a lot with my with my body to roll the boat and in the wild adjust the mainsail. 
taking the main stale from the block that is fixed on the main traveler. So I can manage all the excursion of the main. Uh, speaking about the planning condition, first of all, have fun. <laughs> and uh, no, of course, I sail with the main traveler all the way down. Uh, no bang. I control the, the leech just with the main ship. And uh, I'm focused, I'm really, really focused on the healing angle. The communication in this case is basically between the Jennifer trimmer and the Hasman, and I jump inside the communication. Sometimes, you know, if I can trim more the main or if I feel overpowered. So this is my two cents about the, the downwind. Yeah, my two cents, and I'm going to try to beat you to be faster than you than that was, Julio. But uh, primary <laughs> primary boat balancer, if it's light to moderate, I try to move a lot to help the boat stay on the correct heel yeah. angle and move my weight to help the boat go down waves if necessary and then feedback on the mode. I, I'm the tactician downwind, so it's important we're achieving the correct modes, but it's really the driver and the trimmer who are doing the up ones, down ones to keep the boat on the right heel angle and in the right modes, but providing feedback is really important. So keep it on eye in the big picture. Awesome. We um, received so just we a have... question about the downwind, in the strong wind, about the backstay. And yeah. uh, yes, it's streamed, you know, it's the big deal between light medium and strong that you use the backstay in the in the downwind the in, yeah. in the downwind in the strong wind condition so backstay home absolutely yeah. so we did have one question about uh does it matter if you guys use the f1 or the xcs2 main how you're trimming it i would say the short answer is uh no the principles of trimming the main are still the same it's just two different model sales and how you tune the rig so um what i did want to do is uh you guys did a great job we all really appreciate the time that you two put into this um we did have a video to show but due to some internet issues we're not gonna be able to show the video so um you know again <laughs> we would just want to uh, thank you two for doing doing this talk these two are not giving themselves enough credit for how much time and effort they put into the j70 class so um if anyone out there has any questions feel free to email zeke or julio or myself um, we're glad to answer all the questions, and we were glad to spend all this time with you guys today. Hope uh, everyone's staying safe, and we hope that everyone will join us next Monday for the Downwind Sailing Talk. And uh, looks like it's happy hour for a lot of people out there. So everyone go grab a drink and, and have a good night, and thank you guys again. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys for having me, and thanks everybody that's here. We know it's, uh, it's, we value your time being with us today, so thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks guys. Thank Alan, thank Zeke, and thank thanks everybody. I've been really, really, I'm really happy to to be with you this evening, and uh, it's been a really nice talk. Thank you guys. Thank you everybody. Uh, stay safe out there, and we'll talk to you next week. Ciao. Bye.